Well, I'd like to invite our speakers to the chairs up here now, and we'll start our panel discussion. Um, I'm really hoping to... <coughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, great, thanks. Um, I really am hoping that we'll get lots of questions from the floor because I ask questions all the time in my job and I like hearing other people's questions more than my own. But I'll just kick off by um, asking, you've explained, Sue, uh, what you think is meant by digital citizenship and I loved your explanation but I'd like because there are so many different um, definitions so um, Alastair how do you define digital citizenship? Well I, I, I did read it out <coughs> and I, I should have brought my notes I thought someone's going to ask this question I did say during the speech can anyone remember what I said about choosing uh, how you engage being responsible how you engage can anyone help me with the third give me one second sorry <laughs> Never expect me to remember much, if you don't mind. So, uh, what we say as an office, <coughs> clearly I read as a... Uh, so this is your formal definition, <laughs> of the, the office's formal yes, definition. Yes, you see it's well rehearsed too. Uh, <laughs> yes, well we say engage positively, which is very similar to what you were saying. Uh, know your online world, so in other words know, I, I guess what it is you're dealing with, and choose consciously to participate. So. Uh, I don't think it's very dissimilar to, to Sue's. I like Sue's as well. And let me pull you up on something. I don't use the phrase uh, real world and online world. I think that's one of the reasons we've failed in the online space, is we've somehow cut it off from our normal expectations of citizenship. Uh, and as a consequence, we've, you know, for over a decade or more, we've drifted and allowed behaviours to happen online that we just wouldn't allow offline. So I don't use real world and online, I just say, that this is a continuum of our behaviour. So frankly, citizenship on, online is, I think Susan's better actually, and I'll be telling the office I like Susan more. <laughs> you change it. Alex, what about you? Well, I agree with the comments that Alistair just made. Uh, when I started at the State Library, I banned the use of the word virtual because virtual seemed to suggest imaginary, uh, that it didn't really exist, and the digital world certainly exists. Uh, for me, it really comes from where I started with the extended acknowledgement of country, that we, over the centuries, have inherited and built up a system of law, of rights and responsibilities, and they extend into all domains of our life, and our lives have now uh, extended into the digital domain, and the same rights and responsibilities need to uh, carry across, but conscious that uh, we live in a a less bounded world uh, than we did uh, in a purely physical world, in the world that uh, my grandparents lived in. And so we need to continue to evolve our uh, regulation, our way of managing that environment, but also uh, keeping firmly to individual liberty. Yeah, I would distill it down to those two R's, rights and responsibilities, and add a third, which is, which is respect. So, as we've heard today, the right to be able to access information, um, the, the right to be safe online, the responsibilities to keep other people safe and to respect other people's privacy, and then respect comes all over the top of that. And continuing on from that, what you were saying, Sue, about cyber safety in libraries and the extra support that you would like from government to uh, to ramp that up, to, to achieve that. What, can you explain more what you meant by that, what you would be hoping for, what sort of support? Well, I think Alistair's already working towards it, which is that there are various departments who've been involved in cyber safety. And we, uh, libraries, libraries are offered every year so many different campaigns, so many different ways to engage um, with national initiatives that really, you know, if you're on the ground, you're drowned out by, can you do a display on this? Can you do a training session on that? Can your team um, support this initiative? Um, what's been great about Alistair's office coming into being middle of last year is that it's kind of being pulled together in one space and it's making it much more effective for us to work um, in a way that um, is manageable for library teams but, but gives the effect for government of actually getting that message across. And I was really pleased to hear that it's getting some traction on the eSafe spaces 
uh, project, and I'm hoping we can roll that out nationally. What more do you think could be done to help make libraries even safer spaces? Well, can I first uh, comment on your respect mm -hmm. issue? Uh, every issue we deal with online stems from either lack of self-respect or lack of respect for others. Uh, as a police officer, it was probably what we dealt with always in terms of criminal breaches as well, but it, 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 it's brought very clearly home to me. So I think in, in your R's, the respect one is perhaps most important. It doesn't mean you have to agree with the person, the classic case of democracy. I don't have to agree with you, but I'll defend your right to, to say what you're saying. I won't shut you down, threaten to kill you, uh, or denigrate you as you make your comment, which is what we do consistently online. So I think respect to answer your question about citizenship, passport, perhaps that, that would be my uh, shorter answer, if it was shorter. Uh, to answer uh, your question about what more we could do with libraries, uh, uh, like any, let me firstly say that I actually subscribe to the fast fail process. Uh, I said that I think we failed as a government. In other words, I don't actually know what the answer is. I don't know what success looks like. I just know what failure looks like. Uh, so if I look at eSafe Spaces, something that we spoke about, uh, uh, what, mid last year, uh, and we had off the ground within a few months. That was something where we were agile, to use a term that is increasingly used, mm. uh, uh, rolled it out. Um, we're looking to see what the results are. As I say, my version of success might be different to Sue's, but ultimately if it raises awareness. To me, this is about uh, helping encourage libraries to consistently be seen as that great uh, place of knowledge and of access to information, and therefore as that great democratic tool. So it's us supporting libraries, and it's libraries supporting us in helping make citizens safe. So maybe it is rolling out e-safe spaces across all public libraries. Uh, I don't want that to be just a veneer. I'd like that to be a true, deep engagement. And I don't know what that looks like, to be frank. Uh, what I do know, uh, to Sue's point, is that uh, we have lots of days of action. Uh, I'd like it to be 365 days of action. I'd like us as citizens to know that we behave online as we should offline, and that doesn't mean we're always behaving well, uh, but we behave reasonably predictably and, and largely well, uh, and that we use libraries as one of those key points, anchors in a community, a place that, that is, uh, is safe physically and therefore safe electronically for people to, to uh, realise that technology. Probably not much of an answer. That's a good answer. Um, at this point, would anyone like to ask a question to a member of the panel? Don't be shy. Metadata. <laughs> Retaining metadata. Yeah, nice. happy to have that discussion. <laughs> I'll ask one. <laughs> um, Alastair, you raised the issue of parents and, um, and parents' roles in, in creating good digital citizens in their children and actually behind well themselves. Now parents came up a lot in the Early Literacy Summit as well, they're their child's first teacher, they are the most important teacher in their life. Having seen Facebook feeds where people are posting all sorts of things about their children, whether it's stories, photographs, etc. that are embarrassing, how does that fit within your cyberbullying concept and what sort of impacts do you think that that might have on children in the future? Yeah. Uh so uh, one of the things we see, very sadly, if I use an extreme example, is uh, people posting photographs of their kids openly on social media and then we come across child sex offender sites where they curate normal clothed photos of kids. These aren't sexual images of children. These are kids that will categorise them as kids playing in park, kids doing homework, kids do doing gymnastics. Then they'll sexualise them through their comments and they'll, they'll carefully curate uh, and then uh, brutally sexualise those images and the children behind them to live out their fantasies. And, and, and I'll go on the public record and say, look, if you're going to share photos of your kids, share them with your friends and relatives, not with the whole world. Uh, use the privacy settings on social media. There's nothing at all wrong with telling embarrassing stories about your kids. I don't know what I'd talk about as a father otherwise at <laughs> dinner parties. But I say that to people that are sitting around the dining room table. Uh, or I share photos of kids with my relatives uh, overseas via email or, or on social media, but I do it by using privacy settings. Um, broadcasting everything about your kids to the world uh, is, is just a huge generational shift 
and, and, and there will be consequences for it. Uh, kids will be, kids are meant to be embarrassed, they're meant to look through those photo albums and say, I can't believe you've got a photo of me in the bath or, or with, with my two front teeth missing or my great school photo of having a, scraped the front of my face off on the asphalt the same day as the, as the, the, uh, the school photo and my grandparents still having it in the photo album, that's fine, but not sharing it with the whole world. Uh, and that's the fundamental difference. The, the other thing I'd say is parents say two things to me as I travel around the country. The first is, I don't understand the technologies my kids are using, which are fundamentally often different to the technologies parents are using. And then they'll say, worse still, I don't understand the way they're using it. So what I would say to people is use the technology their kids are using. If, they're not, if you're not using the same apps as your kids, download them and get the kids to teach you how to use them. Uh, uh, and that way we'll learn together and the kids can say to you, by the way, the way you're sharing information, when they're old enough, the way you're sharing information about me, I wouldn't normally do. Um, and then you can say, well, show me how to change my privacy settings. But do, the, do you but think the concept of rights be forgotten. Yeah, if I just yeah. jump in there, do you think there's um, a gap? Because um, parents with small children now, I think, are getting that message because it's much more spoken about in the media about um, you know, debates about how much screen time, debates about knowing what your kids are doing. And I think there's a, a group of parents in the middle whose kids are now teenagers, perhaps, who, are, who, who don't really understand, for example, privacy settings on Facebook. They've been happily using it for the last few years, but not knowing the best ways to protect what they're putting up. And if that is the case, if you agree that's the case, how do we address that generation of, of parents and kids who are floundering around in this? Uh, well, we're, we're putting up a, a huge amount of how-to videos, really simple how-to videos, stepping people through a process. Uh, and I think it's just having a conversation. I think the reason why the online space is so difficult for us is technology is clearly just ripped through us and we, we use it without understanding it. Uh, but, but, but and it's perhaps, changing so fast, yes, as it, Colin was saying. it changes so, so rapidly that it's, it's mind-numbing and I hate to think where it is in 10 years' time if we're having difficulty now. But it, it's, it's more so this concept that we've, we've just not applied our <laughs> offline common sense to it. So we're increasingly just saying, if, if what you do online just doesn't need to reflect your offline behaviours and here's the three ways you can be doing that today. So it's vignettes, people aren't, people are, are, are googling questions, they're not going to a website to read up, they're not reading the, uh, the, you know, the book, they're googling a question and they want the three points and so we're increasingly trying to create our information. I was at um, uh, Dolly magazine the other day, clearly uh, uh, not my normal demographic and we were talking about videos. Um, and, and I said, yeah, we're, we're trying to use videos to talk to kids. And they said, oh, how long are the videos? And I said, oh, a minute, two minutes? It seems really short to me. And they said, well, you're way out. And I said, well, why, why, why am I way out? And they said, have you heard of Vine? You heard of Vine? Really short loops. They say, well, most of the time we'll communicate with the young women readers in a Vine. And if, if it's a really complex issue, we'll string two Vines together. And that's how long we've got to communicate to that audience. So the information we're giving uh, is long, uh, even though we think it's really mm. short, uh, and we need to make it shorter still. I don't know how we win on that. Yeah, Sue? So, um, on a personal note, can I just check whether I'm a really bad parent? Um, because I've got a 13... If you're a room full of bad parents, we'd all <laughs> think you're a good parent. Well, I've, I've got a 13-year-old and a 15-year-old, and if they want a new form of social media, I make them write me a business case. <laughs> <laughs> and, so they have Sounds to like me. good parenting to me. Yeah, they great. have to tell me the pros, the cons, how much time they're going to spend on it, and what are the risks. They have to research the risks. Is that? I think that's fantastic. And do they do it? Oh, yeah. yeah. I've, in fact, I keep them. Yeah. And they have to mark off against their KPIs. <laughs> I was, one, I think that's great parenting. For the apps that they tell you about, it's really good. Yeah. Uh, for the device that you know about, that's really good because uh, I, I, I note your stats about people that don't have devices, but uh, the majority of Australian kids have access to multi multiple devices um, and they don't have parents as engaged as you. The fact that you're even having a conversation about the pros and cons and the KPIs, uh, which is really good, uh, I'm sure you kids appreciate it, is, is, uh, is fantastic. It's remarkable. And, and you are the poster child of a good parent. Then. I'm going to give you a gold star. But, but then, we come to, then we come to the pri privacy issue too. Okay, so I kept a diary when I was a teenager. I trusted that my mother would never read that diary. Um, 
hopefully she never did. Um, but so, so how far do parents, I'm really interested in this, how far do parents go in digging into what their kids are doing? Because you can always justify it by saying, I'm keeping them safe, I need to know. At the same time, teenagers have a right to be exploring the world in their own way. You might have some thoughts on that, that one, Alex. Well, we all need to live and learn to live in society and we can't protect our kids. Uh, to an extent where we disable them. So I think that we really have to uh, try to develop their critical skills. And to me, that's a key element of digital literacy. So and that's really what Sue's doing with her business case. She's getting them to look at things uh, knowingly and come to a judgment. And that's obviously different if you're talking about a very young child or an early teenager or late teenager, or in my case, beyond teenage. Uh, that we need to really work through those things and build it. Where it gets hard is where you don't have engaged parents, as Alistair just said. I had a very heartening visit to Walgett uh, last September. I was somewhat dreading going there because last time I'd been there, it had been a pretty tough environment. Uh, I was visiting public libraries in that area. And in Walgett, they've engaged the kids who had nothing to do. They were running up and down the streets, um, destroying property, graffiti, uh, having unproductive interactions with the police, uh, using the public library and an inspired community services manager. They've started a whole lot of programs that are engaging those kids. And those kids are now in a position to have a conversation with the people in the library, with their teachers, with the community which they perhaps and probably aren't getting at home to develop those uh, critical skills. So you can do it, but it takes concerted and community effort. Mm. Another question from the floor. I'd like to make a comment that perhaps some of you would like to reflect on, and that's that the things that you're talking about parents doing in all of this context not only requires a really significant level of um, uh, courage and a certain amount of digital literacy, but it also obviously requires basic literacy. And we know that uh, across Australia, around 50% of the population don't have um, adequate reading, writing and, and numeracy skills to function in, a, in the technologically rich world, that's OECD statistics. Um, I'd just like to make the point that libraries are playing a really important role in providing adults and probably particularly in that kind of generation that you're talking about, Louise, where, where they've kind of um, missed the opportunity to, to learn about some of this stuff early on with that basic literacy, which is a really fundamental building block to everything we're talking about. I think Alex used the example in Walgett that it was also... You engaged the kids, but the main aim was to get the young mothers. Yeah, that was literate. that was a further part that um, they were very concerned about the young mothers, the 15-year-old, 14-year-old mothers. So uh, they started an early literacy program aimed at their babies, or overtly aimed at their babies. But the real target was the young mothers to try and develop their literacies, their mm -hmm. their skills, uh, so that they could uh, navigate. Uh, the, the world that we're in. And, and that's an enormous challenge. I think the challenge we have to take in the library world is to get out more. We can't sit there passively waiting for people to come to us. We have to engage with all arms of the community uh, to be able to have that impact. And going around the public libraries of New South Wales, I see many doing it. I see some that could do better. Um, I think one of the, the brilliant things that came out of the National, the National Early Literacy Summit, which we held over the last two days, was a commitment by some major organisations, including Early Childhood Australia, the Australian uh, Literacy Educators Association, uh, ERACI, the research group. Um, some major organisations said they would partner with libraries to, to work on a national strategy. Um, because you're absolutely right, we've got a huge problem in literacy. and, and digital literacy you know, cannot um, take place until we've got people who feel confident um, in that broader kind of literacy space. The interesting thing to me was that um, we started off saying let's do a national early literacy strategy. Um, we were hauled up and told it has to be a national early language and literacy 
strategy because actually um, one of the problems is that kids are not learning the language. All they're getting at a very early age is don't do this, stop doing that, and their vocabulary isn't that great. So when we're trying to explain quite complicated um, things around digital um, opportunities, how do you do that when the vocabulary is so limited? Any comment? Well, so I think we, we are yes. going to have to sure. uh, wrap up so that you just, can all have your cuppa. Uh, just want one more comment. Yes, uh, sure. A, a question really, you know, sort of for the panel. Um, I, I was very struck by the bystander comment. Mm -hmm. Um, and, like, I'm that dreadful aunt who actually doesn't let my nieces and nephews rant online. And, you know, sort of, but I respectfully do it privately and say, I think you should take this offline. This isn't suitable for an online public environment. But, you know, sort of, so how do we as a community, as a library, have this conversation that you wouldn't be a bystander in a physical confrontation, but some of us are bystanders in a physical confrontation, can I say, that, you know, sort of we do walk past a homeless person and not see them. You know, so how do we actually get good community values, both in the physical world and in the digital world, about not being a bystander? And how can libraries have these community conversations? Uh, well, I might start. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it starts with the first person doing it, really. I hate to sound trite. I mean, it is when you see something. I pulled up some people attacking a journalist the other day. Thank where, you. Where, where, where uh, uh, they had told this journalist to essentially go drown himself based on his comments. And, and, and all I said back to these people that were attacking the journal online was, you know, p play the ball. You know, just you, you, you're attacking the man here that's doing it. It was a, a male in this case. But, yes. You know, Telling a guy to go kill himself based on something he'd written online, yeah, uh, and 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 I thought to myself, wow, what's going to happen now? And they just stopped. You know, it's a bit like if you see someone harassing a person on the street, and you just say, not appropriate, or walk with the person. I'll ride with you. Why can't we do the same thing online? Uh, the, the worst case is they're going to turn on you, but at least it's not you know, punching you, then you mute them and you do all those other things if they're really stupid. But it's showing them that they're, you know, it, it's so easy to divide people online, it's so easy to single them out from the, from the pack and just make them feel alone. And it shouldn't be, it's such a great communications tool, it's such a great way of building community and it's, and it's such a powerful way to break it down. So I don't know, apart from just standing up, what you're doing with your nieces and nephews is right. It's, it's pulling them up and saying, it's, it's not right what you're doing. They may not listen to you, but at least you've said it. That's right, yeah. <laughs> a friend of mine uh, pointed out what her nieces were doing and she was unfriended. Um, <laughs> so you've just got to do it carefully. Um, but, but, you know, you've just got to, you've just, you, but you have to, it's our job. It's our job as, as, as yeah. not just adults, but it's our job as citizens to stand up for what's right. And again, it doesn't mean that you have to believe or agree. I didn't agree with what that journalist had written, by the way. Didn't yeah. agree at all, but I, I just thought it was right that he mm. was able to say what he thought. My daughter agonised when she saw a photo of her younger cousin in very scantily, you know, she was 13 and she was online dressed in a way she shouldn't be online. And she agonised about what to do. And I said, call her mother, you have to, call your aunt. And that was dealt with. But it was hard for her as a 23-year-old cousin to intervene, but yeah, sorry. Um, well, I just wanted to say that I think this is a really hard one for libraries and for library staff, because I think we uh, way back had had a kind of an image that we were who said stop, don't do that, you be, know, quiet. be quiet. Be quiet. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to say those words, but but be quiet. And we have moved so far away from that that we are now the enablers. We enable people. How can we help you do that? How can we make that possible? Um, to then be in the position of saying, actually, don't think that's appropriate. You know, I think that's a really difficult conversation to have and the tone of how we do that I think we need to learn and I think that's something that eSmart Libraries addresses to an extent but I think maybe we all need to have a think about what is the tone we use and, and how can we do that without becoming the policeman again Yes, just finally Thank you I'll be in trouble One last question leading on from those, uh, those issues that uh, Alex you mentioned the success of the campaign of I'll Ride With You and certainly out of the summit yesterday we talked about the idea of having uh, the power of those sort of uh, national campaigns like Slip, Slop, Slap, you know, these simple campaigns that actually uh, motivate 
uh, populational response to things. And I'm just wondering, Alastair, maybe you can comment on, uh, is there any intention from the federal government to create these sort of simple but deep messages that actually might shift our population's ability to articulate? We're talking about very complex issues, but we have to make them simple. And, and to, to Sue's point, to find the words that we need to be using so that we have the barbecue pitch, the elevator pitch that just rolls off the tongue, that helps people to understand what they can do um, that's empowering in this space. Uh, so we're at, we're at version 1.0 at the moment. It's an anarchic place. There are great cyber safety resources out there from not-for-profits, for-profits and from government. They largely say similar things. Each has a different emphasis, a different brand, which is fine. Uh, part of me thinks that the way we'll win in this space is, frankly, that patchwork quilt of community-based responses. Uh, the place where we'll win is not advertising necessarily above the line. I don't have the budget to do it anyway. The place we'll win is online, which is where we need to be winning anyway. Uh, so it's being uh, smarter in our... It's more, more concise, smart in our messaging, more consistent across the board. So I see, you know, Alana Madeline, as an example, is a certified training provider, uh, is certified by our office. But, you know, they didn't have to do anything uh, more than they already do to be that because they're a high-quality organisation. There are organisations that need to change some of their messaging, frankly, to be safer for people. But they don't have to be exactly the same. I think it's about a repeated message that is 80 or 90 per cent similar uh, that will resonate with the community. I, I, there are police officers that go into schools and, and teach. That's great. Uh, but that's not going to impact every child or every adult. It'll impact a certain part of that cohort. We will go in and speak. Alana Madeline will go in and speak. And each hopefully grabs a certain part of that cohort and helps bring them along, uh, along the journey of how to be safe. So there's no single answer to this. We're never going to have the money, uh, frankly, to do the slip, slop, slap style campaigns. Uh, uh, but we will have the resources to win online uh, and to work with our not-for-profit and for-profit partners and, and other institutions to do that. I, I don't know what the exact messaging or answer is. We all know what the right advice is. Whether we can find that catchy thing that takes off, I'll support it, whatever it is. Uh, it takes bigger minds than me to, to work that out. But, but I, I, think we're on the, I think we're in the right direction. It's just that we're version 1.0 and we need to be version 3 by tomorrow. And we need that huge step change. I, don't, I just don't know what the step change is. I just know it has to happen. Uh, it, and, and, and any one of the initiatives we're doing might be the thing that catches on. Or it might not be, and it might be the thing started in a few years' time. Mm. So what do you think might catch on? Well, can I just say that um, when we did the National Year of Reading, we were trying to find that slip, slop, slap for reading. And um, coming from a marketing background, the slight epiphany that I had was that actually slip, slop, slap, those kinds of campaigns worked because of television. Because actually everyone watched television, everyone saw television adverts, and it became part of our psyche. I think the digital world has created so many different channels um, that it is really hard to get that same impact that we used to get. So I, I don't have an answer, but I think what was interesting to me was that I'll Ride With You just got into the nation's subcontinent, you know, it got in there within a couple of days. Now, it doesn't matter how many times government says, right, the message is this, and we will have this famous celebrity saying it, and therefore everyone will start repeating it. That's not how it works anymore. So I, I've had a bit of an epiphany that actually I don't, know, I don't know how it works. I don't know how we do this. And I'm not sure it works in the same way it used to work. I'm not sure we can achieve slip, slop, slap. But I would love to talk to anyone who knows the answer. Alex, do you know the answer? No, I don't. <laughs> but I know we can change behaviour. And this morning I drove from Sydney to Canberra. And I remember, I've travelled that road many times, and I remember when it was lined with rubbish on both sides. Today, there's still a bit, but not a lot. And we can change behaviour, and I think Alastair's right. It's the patchwork approach, reaching people in their own place, in their own language. Yeah. Ridding the internet of rubbish, maybe. Thank you so much to our speakers. Please give them a hand.